Ladies and gentlemen, I am Carl Pettis, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Alabama State University. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, President Quentin T. Ross, Jr., and ASU faculty, staff, and students, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this Voting Rights Program. 
from redistricting to gerrymandering when the past meets the present. The National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at ASU is hosting this program as part of its Civil Rights Lecture Series on current topics and events that can potentially shape our future. I would like to thank the National Center Steering Committee under the direction of Project Director and Dean Dr. Janice Franklin and historian Dr. Howard Robinson for their work to present this outstanding voting rights lecture series. We hope that you will enjoy this informative presentation. Hello and welcome. We bring you greetings on behalf of the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at Alabama State University. Today we are happy to host this very important voting rights lecture that speaks to our mission to serve as a research center, a living museum, and a repository of information relevant to the study of civil rights and African American culture. Today's program, which will be aired in two parts, will focus on redistricting and gerrymandering. These politically charged issues are important to understand in a dynamic democratic society where the past meets the present as we confront new challenges to the future of our democracy. Our center has established this lecture series as a way of honoring the rich history of the 1965 voting rights campaign and ASU's role in voting rights history. We appreciate the support of all of you in our audience, and we want to thank our president, Dr. Quentin Ross, our provost, Dr. Carl Pettis, and the entire community as we seek to teach and preserve the legacy of the modern civil rights movement. It is our hope that you will enjoy the presentations from our esteemed guest speakers as they discuss these very urgent social justice issues. Again, welcome and thank you. Good evening. My name is D. Lionel Finley. I'm an adjunct professor of political science here at Alabama State University. And we want to welcome you to part two of our program from redistricting to gerrymandering where the past meets the present. Uh, we are very honored to just look at uh, this critical issue of voting and gerrymandering today. And so as we reflect back on the first part of our program starting on Tuesday night, uh, we heard from Dr. Joel Reed and Mr. John Tanner. Dr. Reed, of course, is chair of the Alabama uh, Democratic Conference. Uh, Mr. John Tanner is the former chief of the voting rights section of the Civil Rights Division uh, of the United States Justice Department. On Tuesday evening, both men outline how the state of Alabama in particular has consistently drawn districts to diminish African-American representation. Uh, you heard Dr. Reed also, also further state how the, the Alabama Democratic Conference uh, has been involved in working to make sure through litigation uh, that African-Americans uh, would get a chance to increase their representation by fighting uh, to draw districts uh, that would increase uh, the chance of African Americans to vote. Tonight, we are just as excited to have three great speakers to come to us. Uh, Mr. James U. Blackshear, longtime civil rights attorney here in Alabama. Uh, Mr. Blackshear, welcome to you. And then Mr. Bernard Simonton, uh, president of the State Conference of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and of course, Senator Bobby Singleton, uh, minority leader uh, in the Alabama Senate. Of the, and so welcome, gentlemen. We look forward to tonight as we talk about uh, this subject of gerrymandering and what it means to us. Uh, as we reflect on the past 50 years in particular, when we talk about the Voting Rights Act and the impact it has had on increasing the opportunity for Blacks to vote, gerrymandering is not new. But today we want to look at whether it is more about partisan politics or whether you see a lot of uh, racism involved in it. In other words, a deliberate attempt 
to keep minorities, blacks in particular, uh, from exercising political power. And you three gentlemen, I think you've been on the front line there. You're able to tell us about it. So Mr. Blackshear, again, a long time civil rights attorney. And of course, we know the history of the NAACP and their fight for justice and freedom over the years. Mr. Simon, we certainly welcome you. And, and Senator Singleton, you are in the Alabama Senate. I have watched you all down there. I know about the current litigation going on now. And so we know that you're on the front line also. But at this time, we're going to start off. Gentlemen, we're going to give you approximately oh, 15 minutes to talk about uh, your presentation. If you need a little longer, go ahead and do it. I think we can be flexible. Mr. Black here, we're going to start with you. Can you hear me? I'm unmuted. Uh, I can hear you very well, Mr. Blackshear. So first of all, I guess to uh, answer your question, Dr. Finley, about uh, about the history of gerrymandering, uh, it does go back a long way, of course. But it's always been about both race and politics in the state of Alabama. Uh, that is, uh, since Reconstruction, the one, Demo one party uh, has claimed to be the party of whites, and the other party has claimed to be the party of blacks. Uh, that's because during Reconstruction, the Republican Party nationally uh, championed the not only the end of slavery, slavery, but the Reconstruction Amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And as we know, the Democratic Party of Alabama proclaimed itself to be the party of white supremacy. And they were the party of white supremacy until 1965, when uh, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. And when he did so, he said, well, there goes the South. And, uh, and he was right. Hold on a second. Some noise in the background. And he was right. And at that point, uh, as black voters began to support candidates of the Democratic Party, uh, the Republican Party instituted its well-known Southern strategy and uh, invited whites to join the Republican Party who tended to oppose voting rights and civil rights. As a result, today in Alabama, uh, there's probably um, 20 to 25 percent of the white voters support Democrats, but still a substantial number who do. Nevertheless, uh, because uh, uh, whites are the vast majority in Alabama, the Republican Party can control every statewide office. And that includes uh, uh, the Alabama legislature now. They've had, the Republicans have had uh, filibuster proof majorities in both the House and Senate of Alabama. Since the, <clears throat> since the 2010 election. And <clears throat> as a result, uh, the, uh, the plans that had been adopted by the Alabama legislature redrawing House and Senate districts and congressional districts in Alabama were drawn by the Republican Party. And uh, in the case of... Uh, the congressional districts, I would use that as an example to show you what gerrymandering looks like. And I think I can do this uh, by sharing my screen. I'm going to try to do this, uh, staff. Here we go. 
share screen. Share screen. There. Can everybody see the picture of the map of Alabama with districts on it? Uh, Dr. Finley, can you see it? I let me see. No, I just see the program, but that's all right. Go ahead. Well, it ain't going to do any good here. Wait a minute. Let me. Oh, now I see it, uh, Mr. Black here. It's coming up very well. Looks okay. very good. Okay. <clears throat> this is um, this is the congressional redistricting map that uh, the legislature enacted uh, November the 3rd, 2021. And it is being challenged in court in three different lawsuits. Senator Singleton, Senator Smitherman, and three other voters are in one lawsuit. And there are the two lawsuits called Milligan and Castor. And they're all contending that this 2021 redistricting plan is racially gerrymandered, or at least two of the lawsuits are, certainly the Singleton case is. And here's what a racial gerrymander looks like. If you look at District 7, which is the Western Black Belt, and, and see how it splits Tuscaloosa County, Jefferson County, and Montgomery County in a way that separates black voters from white voters in order to grab the, the black population and put it in District 7. Uh, and as a result, that produces, and I'll show you the statistics for the plan that just passed. Can you see those, uh, those figures? Uh, it shows that in District 7, which splits the three counties, the black voting age population is 55%. So is, there's one majority black district. By the way, this is Dave's Redistricting Act app, which I like using because they have a very sophisticated way of reviewing the past decade's election results and applying them to the plan to determine whether it has a partisan lean either, either to Republicans or Democrats. And as you can see, District 7 has a Democratic lean of 67%, but every other district in the uh, congressional plan is 60% or higher in terms of Republican lean. So let me go back. So that's the gerrymandered plan. Now, Senator Singleton and Senator Smitherman and three other voters in the Singleton case filed a lawsuit uh, in September, a month before the legislature went into its redistricting session and presented a plan that would undo this racial gerrymander simply by making Jefferson County, Tuscaloosa County, and Montgomery County whole. In fact, it makes it makes every county in Alabama whole, which is why it's called the Singleton Whole County Plan. As you can see, once you correct the gerrymander by making Tuscaloosa County, Jefferson County, and Montgomery County whole, you keep to the extent you can the black belt counties together. Jefferson County is only 43,000 voters short of being an ideal size for a congressional district by itself. So you add the rural counties of Bibb, Perry, and Hale to get up to equal population. And that produces, let me show you the statistics for the Singleton Hull County plan. That produces 
two districts that have Democratic lean, District 6 and District 7, both 57%, 56%. Even though the black populations, the black voting age populations are less than 50%, it's 46.8 in uh, District 7, 41.4 in District 6. But if you look at the map, District 6 is the Jefferson County District. And it's where the largest number of white Democratic voters are located so that you don't need as many black voters in District 6 in order to provide black voters an opportunity to elect a candidate of their choice. So um, that issue was is before the three-judge federal court in, in uh, Birmingham right now, but instead of addressing the claim in the Singleton case, the uh, three-judge court ruled uh, uh, in the other two cases, which were based on the Voting Rights Act, seeking two majority black districts rather than those what we call crossover districts that are in the in the Singleton plan. Now, I'm not going to go into the, the legal details of what is the difference between a claim challenging the racial ger gerrymandering as, a Smith, as the Singleton case does, or a claim brought under the Voting Rights Act, which is what the Milligan and Castor uh, plaintiffs do. Uh, but uh, the, the difference depends on what the Supreme Court is going to do. As everybody knows, uh, the federal court in the district court in, in Birmingham agreed with the Voting Rights Act plaintiffs uh, and ordered the state to draw two majority black districts or districts that were close to black majorities based on the Voting Rights Act. The state appealed and presently the Supreme Court has accepted that appeal and has notified the parties in that case, that it will ask the question whether the district court correctly interpreted the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and one of the reasons we, uh, the, the, the Singleton plaintiffs decided to pursue a racial gerrymander approach is because we anticipate that the Supreme Court is not going to agree that the Voting Rights Act allows two majority black districts and instead of the one that the current plan has. But that the racial gerrymander approach, which the Supreme Court does approve of, and Supreme Court has expressed, you go back to the statistics of the whole county plan, the Supreme Court has expressed its opinion that crossover districts like the two in the, in the uh, Singleton plan are superior are, are more desirable than majority black districts because crossover districts encourage cross-racial cooperation, coalitions, help reduce racially polarized voting, and in the end, probably provide black voters a better opportunity to influence legislation in Congress. So there's a lot of debate in the black community and among voting rights leaders over whether it's better to have two, con two crossover districts like Senator Singleton is proposing or two majority black districts like the Milligan and Castro plaintiffs want. And there are policy reasons that favor both approaches. But the controlling question is not going to be what black voters want or black political leaders want is what the Supreme Court is going to do. And that's why we have our eye on what's going to happen there. We believe that if the Supreme Court strikes down the, uh, the injunction that the federal court in the district court in Birmingham imposed, uh, it will come back for the district court to consider finally the Singleton plaintiffs whole county 
plan that eliminates redistricting is race neutral and yet yields two districts that provide the opportunity for blacks to elect members of Congress. How am I doing on time? Three minutes remaining. That's correct. Okay. Uh, that's just a quick look at what's going on now. I, I, I could show you the, what, what the maps that the, um, the Castor and Milligan plan is proposed, but we just don't have time for that. And it goes too deep in the weeds. The basic thing for people to understand is that the law is subject to being changed again this decade. The Supreme Court has been changing the law of redistricting every decade uh, for the last 50 years. I mean, I first got involved after the 1980 census. And after every decade, they've, uh, they've announced new rules that we've had to try to adjust to. So uh, now uh, it's, it's the opinion of those of us in the Singleton case that we have a better chance of increasing black representation in Congress if we pursue these crossover districts that a racial gerrymandering approach uh, allows. And I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Finley. Thank you, Mr. Black here. And we do have questions that we'll get back to you. Should uh, I stop sharing? No, no, you're, you're right on time. We're going to be getting back to you uh, with additional questions. Okay. And so, so your timing is quite, uh, well, in fact, you're right on the spot there. And, but we will, we will have questions during our Q&A period. Uh, now, at this time, we are going to have Mr. Bernard uh, Simonton, uh, from the uh, State Conference of the Alabama uh, NAACP, Mr. Simonton. Good evening, Dr. Finley, and those uh, joining us via video. Uh, the NAACP is proud to be here tonight to share some comments about redistricting in the state of Alabama. There are some questions that have been posed to us, and I want to try and answer those questions so that the audience can understand where we're coming from. And the first question that was given to me, it says, discuss why the Alabama NAACP is accusing the white control Alabama legislature with enact enacting congressional and state legislative districts that discriminate, disenfranchise against black voters to maintain power. And of course, the simple answer to that question is, well, because they are. If you look at what the state legislature proposed and what they approve, it does nothing but dilute, disenfranchise, and suppress black voters and is not giving each black voter an opportunity to elect the person of their choice. And what I really mean by that is, and Ms. Blackshear said some of this, but it's packing uh, all the black, a significant number of black voters into District 7, and then spreading the other black voters out too thinly across the other six congressional districts where they cannot form a majority. But the NAACP is involved in the Milligan case, is a plaintiff in the Milligan case, and we were able to uh, come up with a district map where there would be two majority black districts. At least the second one would be a near a majority black district. And as has already been stated, the uh, lower courts in the state of Alabama, the federal courts, agree with us. And, you know, and I know Jim said he didn't think the Supreme Court would agree, but I think once we are able to argue and before the Supreme Court of the United States, because we are basing it on the Voting Rights Act of 1965 where when legislatures try to redraw the district, they must take in consideration the black voters in that state 
or in that district so that they can create the majority black district, the most majority black districts that they can. And of course, the state of Alabama did not do that in this case. They kept the majority voters the way they had done previously. And of course, some of that is uh, by uh, a political association, the Republican a Democrat, but it's also by race. And so what we're asking is that each black voter be given an opportunity to cast a vote and that that vote be count, counted equally as any other voter, white voters in particular. And that's why we are pushing for the Supreme Court to support us in they're ruling hopefully this fall that they will now it's going to be too late for this particular election but if we win in the next uh election where we're electing our u.s congressman they will have to draw a map that has well we've already provided them the map they just have to uh, uh approve the map that we provided to them that has two majority black district now, that was the first question. The second question is, what are your thoughts on the SCOTUS decision in the Shelby versus Holder case, where they ruled that the coverage formula in Voting Rights Act is based on data that was 40 years or 50 years old? And the NACP was involved in that case as well. And, of course, we know what the uh, Supreme Court ruled that you know they essentially gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, when they said the formula that was used in 65 no longer was appropriate because they didn't require you to tell how many bubbles in a bar of soap in order to register to vote. You don't have to, you don't have to pay poll taxes. But the state of Alabama, as soon as the Supreme Court ruled in that case, they had the photo ID bill, photo ID bill that had been signed, but they had not tried to enact it because they knew that they could not enact it under the uh, guidelines on the voter uh, on the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But as soon as the Supreme Court made its ruling, the state of Alabama proceeded with enacting the uh, uh, the bill that required photo IDs. And I know a lot of people say, well, everybody should have a photo ID. Perhaps that's true, but there are a lot of people who do not have photo ID. And in order to vote, you should not be required to pay anything. Voting rights is one of the fundamental rights given to us under the Constitution of the United States and further codified and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so you should not have to pay in order to get a government furnished photo ID. And I know the Secretary of State has uh, has said that he will go anywhere to uh, give anyone a, uh, a free photo ID, but, and I understand that, but that's not getting to everyone. There's still people who uh, do not have the photo IDs for various reasons. And the Justice Scalia, who was on the court during this time, he made a very, I guess, devastating statement. And when he said something that racial uh, voting is some type of racial entitlement. And, and that really, I was in the court the day he made that uh, statement. And it really hit to the core of I think what the Supreme Court, well, a majority on the Supreme Court was thinking is some kind of racial entitlement. It is not. It is your right as a citizen of the United States to be able to cast your vote for the person that you want to vote for and to elect a person of your choice to serve and whether that's in the uh, U.S. Senate, 
U.S. House of Representatives or state offices or local, anything from your city council to sheriff, it's your right. And we want to ensure that that is protected and that people are not either packed or cracked, uh, packed into one district or cracked so, so spread out that they cannot form a majority to elect uh, a person of their choice based on communities of interest. A third question that was posed to me is, says, could you elaborate on the reasoning behind the NACP court challenge to the congressional district plan that included only one district with a majority of black voters? And I have responded to some of that, but I'd like to just go a little further and say that the constitution and more important, federal law requires map drawers to be fair by not diluting the power of black voters when they draw maps. Again, in Alabama, the state legislature failed to comply with the Voting Rights Act and admitted that they spent little or no time on the analysis required to ensure that its congressional district plan was fair to black voters. They instead split up communities across six different districts and cramming the remaining black voters into one district. In other words, Alabama congressional district plan drew only one of seven congressional districts in which a blacks had a majority vote. Now the black population in Alabama is roughly 27%, perhaps a little more, a little less, but that's what the recent census told us. And if you do the math, the calculation with 27%, there should be two majority black districts or near majority black districts in the state of Alabama. And that's just doing the math. And, and of course, we know the, the district cannot be gerrymandered. So where you take a, someone in Mobile and put them in a, a district in uh, uh, Huntsville, something like that, you know, we understand that. But uh, uh, there are incidents where uh, district maps may not be perfectly uh, drawn in order to achieve a uh, achieve black majority voters in some instances. So uh, that's what we are asking the federal government, I mean, the federal, uh, well, the state of Alabama first, and then we ask the federal courts to look at. And again, I would reemphasize that uh, the district courts rule in our favor and was only overturned by the vote in the Supreme, uh, and really was not overturned by the Supreme Court because their ruling was basically saying that, well, because of the uh, the election, the closeness of the election, uh, they didn't want to throw the Alabama election in disarray by ruling that they, uh, the Alabama had to redraw their maps. And so uh, I think the uh, plaintiffs and the attorneys are feeling pretty good in that case. And of course, you never know what the Supreme Court may do. The final question that was asked is says in terms of redistricting, what would the NACP like to see happen in the state of Alabama? And again, I think I've shared some of the information of what we'd like to do, uh, like to see. And that is that we'd like to see black voters uh, have an opportunity equally to cast their votes and the vote should not be, it should, should be an, uh, a vote that is not hampered in any way, meaning that uh, if you are registered to vote, you should be able to go to the poll to vote. Your name should be on the roster to vote. A lot of times the city's state will change you from one district to another. 
And I was changed from uh, a district, from one district to another where I live. And I didn't find out about it until I started going to the Secretary of State's website and saw that they had changed me to another district and I live in Limestone County. <clears throat> and uh, I know Mr. Blackshear talked about one vote, I mean, whole county votes. And that's good, but <clears throat> that's not always possible. And I'm not a, necessarily opposed to that, but it's just not not always possible to to do that. And so, uh, again, what the NACP and other organization like the NACP, what we are wanting to see the state of Alabama do is comply with the 65 Voting Rights Act. And I know some other states have enacted things like you can't give people refreshments or water or food in while they're standing in line to, to vote. So those are the things. And we want to make sure that each person has an opportunity to cast their votes. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Simonton. We will now hear from uh, Senator Bobby Singleton, minority leader uh, in the Alabama Senate. And uh, Senator Singleton, I believe you have uh, some questions before you. Uh, if you would, uh, we would appreciate you kind of using those as a guide, though feel free from your own experience uh, to come forth as you would see best. Uh, but if you can, we would certainly like to see you uh, respond to those three questions that had already been presented uh, earlier to you. Senator Singleton. Yes, Dr. Finley, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to come here today. I want to thank the Center, the Center for uh, Civil Rights for having me on today. Uh, to my good friend, uh, Jim uh, Blackshear, who's been my attorney since 1984, uh, in my first stint uh, of voters' right as a city councilman back in the city of Greensboro, when I filed my first lawsuit, uh, basically alleging that the election was stolen from a majority black population of 70% uh, in Hale County. Uh, we were able to get and join in the Dillips versus the United States case that went uh, to the uh, federal district courts, but the city of Greensboro, Alabama, then decided that they were trying to go even further, not settle. Um, and I just wanna uh, thank my good friend, Bernard Simonton for the work that he's doing out here with the NAACP in the Milliken case. Um, just to give you a little background uh, with the legislature, I've been in the legislature since 2002. So I came out right off the back end of the, the 20, uh, the 2000 uh, redistricting and, and Democrats were in power. And let me just say this to you. The, the issues that we have is not just synonymous to Republicans. Uh, this is just a deal with white men. And uh, when re Democrats were in, in power, we were still fighting for some of these same rights and same issues of gerrymandering, uh, packing and stacking and cracking that when Democrats was in power. So let's just, let's just be real. Let's get the 800 pound gorilla out of the room here. That this is not just to, to uh, Republicans. And so Republicans at that time were, were in the super minority as we are today in the Alabama legislature. So we had to fight uh, to, to go to court just to be able to get eight black districts in the Senate and, and some 26, 27 uh, seats in the House in order to maintain them. Uh, while voting laws wasn't as prevalent in passing as they are today, but we still had to have those fights every 10 years. And so ever since 2010 and the 2020 uh, census came around, I've been a plaintiff in some case that's been going before the federal courts and, and eventually up to the United States Supreme Court. Um, just my passion and, and, and things that I believe in protecting those civil rights of, of our people. I, um, I, I deem myself the protector of, of the Voters' Rights Act after the Holder case went down and, and said that we were try to fight in the legislature every case that can, every piece of policy that came up 
that was changing any voting laws or were against you know our people from being able to have free and access to the to the voting uh, box um and i think that one of the cases were asked that well based on the the the, the holder case whether or not uh have we seen a lot of gerrymandering uh since then it's not so much of gerrymandering since the holder case it is trying to fight off with all of these other laws in between the 10 years such as uh, no absentee voting. We, you wouldn't believe the number of, of election laws that are being presented before the legislature. However, we're able to beat them down and they don't get passed. Um, right now, there are some bills that are out there that we are watching in these last seven days. Uh, you know, they're coming up with bills about you can't vote in two states. Well, we're saying that's fine. You can't do that anyway. That's a violation of the law anyway. We're okay with that but no curbside voting. And it seems to be just a, a repetitious kind of thing that Republicans are doing from a national point of view, uh, that it becomes their red meat kinds of policy and legislation that they're pushing out there just to be able to, to try to disrupt uh, the voting uh, system. So, but what we're saying to them is that when you open that Pandora's box, it opens for everybody. Believe you me, it's going to affect you and your people at the polling places also. And so um, we just believe that trying to fight off all of those laws in between time of the, the uh, reapportionment period is where the fight really is. Uh, making sure that they can't move polling places uh, without at least uh, <clears throat> talking to local people before they move them or making sure that they got handicap ramps the places and, and things of that nature to make sure that when they do move them that there's actual lighting i know that there were one bill uh that was that was presented in 2018 that said that the the polling officials didn't even have to make sure that there was adequate lighting in a building and so we have to fight those kind of bills back most of them don't make it to the floor for debate we kill them in committee or they just don't make it on the the agenda but those are the kind of things that are happening. Um, in the cases that we are looking at um, here in the, in the Singleton case, um, that's before us now, what we saw in the legislature is this, is in 2010, um, the legislature set a set of rules to do a 1% deviation. And that's plus or minus 1%. And that was the first time that has ever happened in the state of Alabama. We had always used a 5% plus or minor deviation, which then created a vacuum for Republicans to be able to pack and stack and gerrymander black folk and put us all in certain districts and pack our districts to 60 and 70 and 80% in House and Senate districts which then gave them some super majorities and opened up a lot for more Republican districts across North Alabama, where you see a super majority there. Uh, we saw more in South Alabama. We see a threat in the Mobile area where we are beginning to possibly lose uh, some of those uh, black districts in the Mobile area, where they're becoming 45, 55% kind of districts under that 1%. And this year they came back and decided well we possibly made a mistake and so we're going to go back to a five percent deviation well the five percent deviation was based on the fact that they felt that what we as blacks were going to be asking for is under the rules was a five percent we were going to be asking for whole counties because the state constitution allows us to deal with whole counties and prior to the earlier days in the, in, the, in the 70s and the 80s, all of the maps in the state of Alabama was drawn on whole counties. And so we were trying to get back to that and to make sure that when we look at it, we can have community of interest. We'll make sure that uh, we weren't pitting uh, incumbents against each other. And so this time around, they decided that they were going to be slick and we'll give them what they're asking for. Maybe that can take away the legal issues for going into court because now 
we have been dwindled down through the court system as jim has said every year they've basically been doing something to our voting laws across the united states and so where we are now under section two section four section five of the voting rights act we're basically dwindled down almost to some singular issues as to having standing uh to make sure that we can be able to have that access to the courts and so they were being smart this time and trying to set some general rules to be able to keep us from going to court and they drew districts this time around uh on a whole county platform and keeping community of interest not pitting together any of the the uh, incumbents and so it it basically uh we looked at the maps that we were given under the house and the senate rules um and we almost you know with the numbers that we are there and the and the and the the loss that we had in population in our districts and let's just be real about it we weren't answering our census we weren't making sure that we were getting our people uh uh census back in so now we were losing a number of people in our districts so you look at senate 23 that represent the black belt selma uh in those areas they lost you know a lot of people in that district that was a tremendous loss over in that district so we're just hemorrhaging hemorrhaging for people in our districts so that we can maintain to be able to go to the table and draw maps that will be non-gerrymandered or whole county to make sure our communities of interest were still together and making sure that we weren't pitting uh incumbents against each other and so we're we're we're, we're stuck here now just trying to make sure that we maintain what we have with our eight black senate districts our 27 house uh districts and the numbers to be strong enough to make sure that we at least get our people elected again because our numbers were very very low in the real portion counts and so um we're just gonna have to continue that fight to make sure that our people are getting those census answered and making sure that the importance of it um and and to making sure that we, we we continue the fights that we have on policy level to make sure that we don't allow any of these crazy voting laws that are being enacted in other states across the nation doesn't happen here in alabama back in the day under the holder uh as, as brother simonton said after the holder decision they bought on the um the the photo id law i sat with uh former secretary of the state jim bennett to whom they brought back in to handle that piece for him and we were able to work through with with jim to make sure that there was no cost for anyone because right at as the law was passed that we were able to we would have had to pay at least 25 dollars to be able to get a get an id and so sitting with jim because we left um a clause in the bill that would allow him to be able to create applicable law and to further it based on what he saw was needed we didn't have to go back to the legislature to change anything for him not to charge anyone for any of the ids that are out there in the state of alabama and that has been one of the saving pieces for us uh in terms of that fight of, of ids is because they are free and so uh with that dr finley i didn't hear a lot of your introduction uh my 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 uh volume was muted and you were sounding you know real monstrous over here okay and i you know, found that out yes and so i wasn't really clear of your instructions but we can come back to some of those questions again if you want to ask them a little bit later here in, in your presentation okay senator well now how am i coming through it now you're very you're very good okay so but I'll tell you what, Senator, you you covered those questions quite well, and I think our audience heard them. Uh, let me do this. Uh, I have a, a question in the chat there, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Blackshear first. But uh, in our chat box, uh, there's a question that reads, there's a lot to put behind us in 2022 uh, to further Voting Rights Act. It should be as we look ahead to voting rights 
uh, in, in voting in 2022, with gerrymandering being at the top of the list. And the question is, what can I, as a concerned citizen, do to fight gerrymandering? That is a question in the chat box. Either one of you. Well, Mr. Okay. Senator Singleton and uh, Mr. Simonton. Well, and this is a, a, a some may call a simplistic answer, but it, it starts with, I mean, one thing we need to do is just get out and vote to elect people who are not going to support these kinds of laws. And that's that's one of the basic things that we need to do. And the other thing is to ensure that people, uh, you know, when the census is taken, make sure that people are counted, not yes. try to hide when the census takers come around, because we need you to be counted because we need to get a accurate statement of who's how many people are in each district and of course how many people are in the state so that you know we can give our legislature the tools they need to to hopefully you know come up with the right uh, uh districts and everything uh mr blackshear <clears throat> there have been a lot of grassroots organizations uh active in the redistricting process, uh, this go round. Um, uh, uh, what's the name of the umbrella organization? Uh, 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 Bernard, is it uh, Alabama Forward? Yes, Alabama Forward. Yes. And they've been attending all of the, uh, the legislative sessions. They've been attending uh, all of the public hearings that the reapportionment committee held around the state and are still very active. Um, but of course, uh, and, and it's important, even though they had found out that the, for example, with respect to the congressional redistricting, they found out that their input wasn't even heard by the people who drew the plan because uh, the legislature's map drawer simply sat down virtually and on one occasion in person with the incumbent members of Congress and said, how would you like me to change your district? They told him, they worked it out and then they delivered it to the Alabama legislature and the leadership of the legislature simply rubber stamped what the members of Congress wanted and all of the efforts of the grassroots organization to have their input heard went for naught. Uh, but it was an important uh, educational experience for those citizens, and there were many. Uh, and, and, it, and that's going to be very helpful, not only now, but in the future. It's going to be more and more difficult for gerrymandering to happen the more ordinary citizens understand not only how it's done, but how important it is to the way we experience government and whether laws are going to be passed and services are going to be delivered that help us rather than the, uh, the elite few who are able to, uh, to lobby the legislature or lobby the Congress. Senator Singleton? Well, I, I agree with the two gentlemen, and I also think that, you know, we have some cases that are here on the table right now. Uh, support the cases that are out there, the Singleton versus Merrill, you know, the, the Mulligans and the, and the Gilligan cases and the Castor case, um, and get involved at the grassroots level uh, because these cases has to be decided in the courts. You know, the fear that I have, uh, uh, Dr. Finley, is that we're looking at a serious uh, gutting of the Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. That's my big fear. And I may be wrong, but that is a big fear that I have that could come out of all of this at the end of the day. And, and who really wins out of that? We really don't. And so we've already got Section 5 in terms of preclearance gone. Section 2 could be gone. And so we need to be advocating for Congress. And let me say to that person who said, we need to be writing Congress letters right now to say to Congress to go on and pass whether it's the John Lewis Voting Rights Act or whatever Voting Rights Act that they're going to do at the 
congressional level so that we can at least continue to have the protections that we need as citizens in the state and, and across the United States. That's what we could do. Let's do a campaign to Congress and tell them to get on top of what they're doing because we can't change it at the state level. It only can be changed at the congressional level. And I think you've heard uh, from each of our three guests there some very succinct responses on what you can do as ordinary citizens to make a difference uh, with regards to gerrymandering. Uh, Mr. Simonton, as I heard you starting off, look, get involved. Uh, pay attention to the census. Thank you so much for that. Now, uh, as we look at the question, starting with you, uh, Mr. Black here. Is there anything that you want to add to your presentation that you've already gone over that you would like to leave with us? No, I mean, there is so much that could be said without, without launching into uh, additional, additional um, details of other legal issues involving redistricting. I would say this, uh, we are at a time when this country is so racially polarized that our local elections and our state elections in Alabama are being driven by the national political agendas, as everybody understands. Uh, and we need, we need to, to find ways that we can overcome this division uh, or else the rule of law itself could be under attack. I mean, there are, there are, as if you read the newspapers, you can see that right now, uh, every day, there's, there's another question whether uh, a state legislature is going to uh, give itself the power to overcome or uh, to, to reject the will of voters in the next election and uh, determine what its own slate of electors will be for president. That's literally on the table in some states. Uh, democracy itself in this country is under attack. Here in Alabama, I don't believe that the people of Alabama would stand for having their democratic rights taken away. And we need to engage each other in a way that it, if doesn't eliminate at least ameliorates, lessens this polarization that we have between black and white, Latino, and um, and, and 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 political parties. Thank uh, you, Democrats and Republicans. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Black. Here, Senator Singleton, uh, 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 Mr. Simonton, uh, any any closing thoughts? Go ahead, Dr. Simonton. Okay, uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, <clears throat> there's a saying that says all politics are local. And that's what we need everyone to get involved locally. Uh, I got received a call today from, uh, there's still redistricting going on at the city council level. And so I don't know where everyone that's on the call, where they live, but but if your city has not approved its redistricting plan, go attend those city council meetings and speak out, learn what the issues are and learn how they are trying to prevent creating additional minority of black districts within your city council and get involved, learn the issues and then, you know, uh, as Senator Singleton said, get involved and don't, just don't let anyone ram anything down your throat because people perish because of lack of knowledge. And so you need to get involved, learn the issues, and learn what redistricting, German, and all those term terms are. Thank you there's very a much. Question, there's a question that came. Thank you, Mr. Simonton, for that. There's a question that came through. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. I see here. Look like is it to your knowledge, has there been a serious bipartisan effort to talk about redistricting in Alabama that attempts to negotiate various interests outside of the court system? No. <laughs> let me tell you no. And 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 let me say this to you. 
is that as a part of the redistricting permanent committee, as a member who have been on this committee since uh, for the last 10 years, uh, I sit through every one of the public hearings that went on and even been in the room with the chairmen. As members, we didn't get an opportunity to see the district maps until the day that we were going to vote on them. We had no prior knowledge about what was on the congressional map. We had no prior knowledge what was being drawn for House and Senate districts, no more than them coming to us and asking us in our own personal Senate districts, what areas would you like to have? And there was nothing certain that you were gonna get it. So there's no conversation. And when I went to them and asked the chairman, can we have this conversation to be able to draw maps so it would keep us from being able to have to go to court and we can come up with an agreement, it was turned to deaf ear. They had no intentions of sitting down and doing anything in a bipartisan manner based on redistricting. Thank you so much uh, for that to all three of our special guests tonight, uh, <laughs> Attorney Blackshear, uh, uh, Mr. Simonton of the NAACP, Senator Singleton, you all have left us with a wealth of information to think about as we look at this issue of gerrymandering. And thank you so much for informing us that each of us as individual citizens can make a difference. Get out and vote. Be ready to write uh, to our congressman and let them know how you feel. Now, at this time, we will have, a, a, you know, closing remarks from uh, our provost, but again, thank you to the audience uh, for your participation, the questions that you sent in. Uh, they were very helpful and trust that you have gotten something out of this program tonight. At this time, we'll hear closing remarks from Dr. Pettis, uh, provost for academic affairs here at Alabama State University. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending today's Voting Rights Lecture Series that examined issues of redistricting and gerrymandering. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation of this program hosted by the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture here at ASU. As Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Alabama State University, I would like to thank our distinguished guests and moderators, the National Center staff and its steering committee for their work to host today's event. We would like to thank all of you in our audience for your support of the National Center, and we invite you to attend all of the events of this series that celebrate the history of the voting rights movement and today's focus on social justice. Please be sure to join us for future informative and provocative National Center programs. Again, thank you. Mm -hmm.